with day-to-day -day living I'd say the houses are, are pretty okay you have you do have your poor people of the place and you have people who are in better circumstances but overall the the houses are pretty much all the same they have a uh, cement foundation and um, it's actually more advanced now than it was before they used to have places um, or people that the families would live in these houses or huts that they call faretonga and so they use like pretty much all the things they had around there the coconut leaves and um, wood around and they would build up these big faretongas and they were actually long and they would have like straw on top and everything so um, they used to live like that but now it's more modern and people really just live with uh, pretty much they I still would say they're small houses but they're livable and it's uh, it's not that bad um, they have four walls uh, some of them are made out of um, I don't know how to say it. It's like kappa, like the tin, not tin can, but like um, just certain materials that were kind of, you know, you would say here it's like flimsy, but it was something to them. And they would have like, I guess the inside would just be uh, laced with the, the two by fours and stuff to hold up the structure. But most of the stuff was livable. Um, how people would get around transportation. There are, there are a lot of cars. Um, people also walk around and um, they also uh, have buses out there and um, the buses out there are pretty cool they they um, it's actually not limited to how many people could be in there because you have people hanging out the window or even like out the 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 front door the, even um, the way you take the bus too it's like it's weird and you know I'm used to in America you pay to get on but you actually pay to get off like, yeah, you can just hop on and um, it was just, you know, we didn't really see it, but um, sometimes they let missionaries ride for free because they just knew we were going somewhere good. <laughs> but uh, transportation is really uh, simple out there. In some areas where I served in isolated areas, there's actually some places with only one car for the whole uh, town. And that one car would be rarely used uh, their main transportation would actually be their feet and they would do all their work and transporting things with uh, wheelbarrows so they would use the, the actual wheelbarrows just to get their daily life chores done um, the actually it was like a van that they ripped back the, the open the, the back door off so that they could use it to like stuff it with um, a whole bunch of coconuts or different things that they needed to take around the island but it was rarely used so another thing the the plants and stuff um there's areas like with the they have like pineapple fields and stuff it's really hot sticky but um i've actually gotten to help out with a couple of the farms um you get cut up a lot probably want to dress um with long sleeves and maybe some jeans or something but um, they also had these little, the only thing that they have poisonous in Tonga is, um, it's called a molokau. I think it's like a long centipede, but they're really, um, it's, it's, it's kind of like burgundy and they're, they're, I guess they're poisonous, but a lot of, a lot of the Tongans get bit and they don't actually die, but um, I, I don't know if they built the immunity to it or something, but um, there actually have been cases where, uh, you know, uh, Caucasian people would go over there, or people from, not from Tonga would go and get bit and actually die from those bites. But those are the only uh, poisonous things that I know about in Tonga, is the, the centipedes. Um, they're not too much, but they're mostly in moist uh, farm areas. So depending on where you're at, you bump into those. They do have their typhoon season. Um, I was lucky enough not to be at one of them. They've actually had uh, a big hurricane that just happened. Uh, I think it was uh, last year, 2014. And it took out uh, one of the whole islands. Um, all the houses were actually demolished. The only thing left standing were just a couple of the strong houses and, and the churches that were there but um they do have a lot of the typhoons out there uh, another crazy thing is you could hear the rain coming from somewhere like um 
it was weird. Uh, uh, at first, I wasn't really used to it. Uh, I'd have mission companions um, who were actually from from Tonga, and they would tell me like, hey, "We had to go look for a house to go and just wait." And I was like, "For what?" And he's like, "It's raining." I was like, "No, it's not." And then all of a sudden, you'll hear like you'll hear the rain like closing in, and it's like banging on the the copper houses. Like you can hear the tin, like the rain just like trickling down on all these houses. And um, I would look down the road and you could see a big wall of rain just running towards you. And you're like, oh, my God, like, how did you call that? And just, you know, uh, I didn't know how bad it was. But um, they had their ways of telling what, what the weather might look like uh, just by certain signs. They'll, I guess, look at birds or there's certain things like dogs will run away or something like that. And they'll say, like, it'll start to rain or not. So yeah, that was one of the crazy things. I jumped back and forth um, for my first three transfers. I was in the Nugualofa, but not the main town. There's also like other areas outside. And so I served in town for one transfer, it's Havelu. Then I moved over to, to a, a rural area in the west side, or they call it Hihifo. And it's, uh, the area I served in was Nukunuku, and I served there for two transfers. Um, that one's it's more like a farm area and then I've, after the transfer I actually had a chance to go and serve in Vavau. Um but the one of the unique things I think that I got from my mission is um, the transfers were uh, either done by plane or by boat and so I actually got to go on a boat and go to this island um, I'm not sure how far it is but the trip on the boat actually took uh, about 24 hours yeah so like a whole day um i just remember getting on the boat it's this big smelly boat like it smelled like gasoline it just wasn't nice and the thing that was scary is that um i think about two years before that um, one of the boats actually went down and a lot of people you know passed away so i stayed on top of the boat which could probably be the worst part of the boat because it sways and so if you're sitting on the top, you get most of the momentum. And um, I have a weak stomach, I guess. I have motion sickness, that, especially when it comes to being seasick. They, um, all the tongues knew I was seasick. <laughs> I just, uh, the, the, the thing was, um, traveling by boat, you just got to see the open ocean. And it was pretty crazy. It was one of the best uh, experiences I had. Um, so you go on a boat. Um, this is actually one of the pretty cool parts is that you go on the boat and for about four hours you're out on sea You don't see nothing and then all of a sudden uh, You see all these little boats come out of nowhere and all these little boats are actually uh, Talking people like ready to pack stuff on or pick people off the boat And so the reason for that is that they had a little stop but it was these little islands and it's 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 one of the main islands called the hot by but before you get to hop by, you hit a place, it's called Lulunga, and they have little tinier islands. These are all isolated islands, but there's no electricity that these islands live off of. And so you wouldn't tell unless it was like clear daylight, then you'd be able to see the islands. And so you have all these people picking all their stuff up, either luggage or maybe it's food or something the family are visiting. And so they grab their families and they actually go out. And so that was one of the crazy things I got to see was these boats come out of nowhere and these guys, you know, they, they make it look like it's easy. Like they just go out there and then they go back to their own little island, but it's like in the dark and I don't know how they get back. <laughs> but after a couple of hours of that, so it's four hours to there and then another three hours you hit hop by. And so you, it's like the middle, you would say it's like the midpoint to Vavau. And so hot by is a hot place. It's like a long strip of sand but people live there too and um, Yeah, you just stop there for about two hours and then you get back on the boat and so you ride for like another 14 hours to, to Vavau and Vavau actually is different from Tonga um, Although it's an island in Tonga uh, Tonga is actually just flat and it's not much, uh, you won't really see anything in the air. There's a lot to see everywhere, but it's just, it's flat. So once you get to Vavau, 
um, the way we got to Vava'u is you kind of go around the whole island to get into what they have is like their dock so that the, the boat can park and everything. But the way you get into it is that you have to go around the island and then go inside. And so you have like these big hills or what they call in Tonga mountains, you know, and they have all these mountains everywhere. But it's like the middle of the town is inside and you have like these waters everywhere. But it's like, it really is literally like paradise. So it was a, it was a crazy sight to see. It was uh, an even greener place, but with hills and mountains and stuff. And you just see like how tropical it is. So that was the difference in geography for that.